I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And here today with me is Gary Wagner, executive producer at thegoldforecast.com and also a regular contributor to Kitco News. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you. Thanks for inviting me. And it is good to revisit with you guys again. Thanks. Really good to be catching up. It actually, it's been some time since we last spoke and a lot has changed for gold during that time. Lots of exciting moves. We've had gold breaking records this year, recently getting above 2,500 per ounce. Although, of course, we've seen today a small pullback there. So I wanted to start a little bit broad just so we set the stage for this conversation and ask you, where do you see gold in the cycle right now? Well, we're obviously in the midst, probably more than the beginning of a major bull rally, uh, bull rally, a rally that is historical in nature, in that since April, we've made, I believe, four record new all-time closes. And that is is startling when you consider that. We're above 2,500, as you said. We're down a little bit today. But I look at this as it was a necessary and needed aspect to gold because it had been going up so strong, so fast for so long without uh, releasing the steam, so to speak. Um, it worried me that we could see a really strong correction. This is what we want to see, in my opinion. But we are in the midst of a historical bull cycle that has taken gold above $2,500 per ounce. I believe that there is definitely steam left, although at any moment, for any reason or no reason at all, we can see the market correct. Of course, we have a speech by Chairman Powell tomorrow at Jackson Hole. So market participants are going to look for more insight into what the Fed will do in the future. The minutes were released this week. And so for that reason, we've gained tremendous insight in that the vast majority of Fed officials believe that it is appropriate at this point to begin cutting rates. And to me, what is most important is not that they're signaling a rate cut in September. It's much more than that. They are signaling a major pivot from a highly restrictive to a highly accommodative monetary policy that's end goal is interest rate normalization. And so what I mean by that is it's not a matter of cutting rates by a quarter or a half a percent in September. It's a matter of their goal that they have laid out in the Summary of Economic Projections, the SEP, in, that includes the dot plot. And if you look at the March and the June editions, the March was looking for a total of three rate cuts this year, a series of rate cuts through uh, 2026, taking us from current levels, which is five and a quarter to five and a half, down to what they're calling normalized rates, which used to be 2%, but now they've kind of raised that to 3%. So they're going to want to reduce it by about two full percentage points from about five and a quarter to about three and a quarter is my sense and do it over the next three years. This is really interesting to look at because toward the beginning of the year, one of the things that I kept hearing was that when the Fed made its first cut, that was when gold was going to really start taking off. And of course, what we've actually ended up seeing is gold started to really move without that even happening. So as we move toward this first cut, what do you think happens to gold? Do we still get a boost there or is that no longer as relevant for gold? We have an interesting scenario of forces moving gold to the levels we have seen. And of course, at the forefront is action by the Federal Reserve. But you also have the fact that central banks have been accumulating large amounts of gold, replacing their currencies, their fiat currencies, with this hard asset because of the stability of it. You've got tremendous interest by retail and institutional investors. Most hedge funds at least have a, a, a little toe dipped in the water, so to speak. Part of that portfolio contains gold, whether it's through uh, paper, electronically traded funds, or futures trading. 
they are participating in China. It's been reported, not only we've all heard about the central banks and, and the large amounts they've been accumulating, but I read an article recently this week that talked about how the retail investor right now has been utilizing utilizing gold as a primary asset group to put their money in as a store of wealth and a stabilizing because in China, they're hesitant to go into the equities markets, hesitant to put them in interest-bearing um, assets. And so the retail investor has been very aggressively uh, accumulating gold in China. India has always been that way. So you've got a multitude of factors. Add to that the geopolitical uncertainty, Middle East, Russia and Ukraine, that's still ongoing. So you've got a number of things that have moved gold to these historic levels. The Federal Reserve, of course, is, is key and important. I think that in terms of current pricing, to a large extent, they fact have already factored into current pricing a rate cut in September. But they're not factoring in the magnitude of interest rate cuts this year. Will it be one? Will it be two? Will it be three? Uh, Reuters did a poll with economists, and overwhelmingly, they're talking about three rate cuts this year, meaning there's three FOMC meetings left in the year. So that would be a rate cut at each one, September, November, December. And I'm not convinced that that has been fully factored into pricing. So there's still room on the upside and plenty of room on the downside to react to all of these variables as they continue to unfold in the news cycle. Definitely, there's there's a lot going on, and you've outlined very many of the factors. I think another thing I wanted to get a sense of is, so the Fed wants to make these rate cuts as it continues to tame inflation, but it also doesn't want to harm the economy too much. And it does seem, though, like cracks are appearing there, especially this past week. It seems like that's what we're seeing. So how, what is your sense there of the, the strength of the U.S. economy, especially as we head to these moves from the Fed? It depends on what we're looking at. Recent reports on consumer spending have shown that consumers in the United States are continuing to um, accumulate purchases at higher pricing, and the higher pricing hasn't stifled that to any noticeable extent. They're also looking at the labor market because we've had some interesting things. The big moves in gold uh, and typically, uh, there's been a couple of points in which we've seen a 60 70 or $80 daily sell-off in gold as this market's moved up. And it's typically as a knee-jerk reaction to a jobs report that has come out. We've got jobless claims that are ratcheting up. So the Federal Reserve is focused on their dual mandate. And their dual mandate is stable prices, meaning having inflation under control. I think from the, the notes and the comments in the minutes that were released this week, I think that for the most part, Federal Reserve officials are comfortable and believe that the restrictive policies they've put into place has been moving, obviously, inflation down. It's sitting, you know, two and a half, three and a half percent, and it is on a trajectory to two percent, their target. Secondly, the Federal Reserve on numerous occasions, whether it's Powell or other Fed officials, have stated they're not going to wait till inflation gets to 2% before they begin their series of rate cuts. But their other mandate is full employment. And so the focus is has been historically in the past that dual mandate and strategically using their monetary policy to affect both in a balanced way because both have equal um both of them are equally important to maintain the economy because if you if prices are too high or if employment goes out of whack you get problems so they've had a balanced approach up until recently where they focused almost solely on price inflation and getting that down because that was very 
um, troublesome, but at the same time, employment was steady. As you just correctly pointed out, now they're starting to see cracks in the employment side. And so I believe that they're going to restructure their focus where the focus is still going to be for both sides of their dual mandate, but they're going to look at it, the employment aspect a little bit closer than they have in the past because that's what's needed right now. If, in fact, inflation is on that trajectory, then really employment is what they have to worry about because that is where there's been signs of potential trouble down the road uh, with rises in jobless claims, with the, the employment levels and things of that nature. So it's always been a balancing act for the Federal Reserve. And they're, they've become experts at walking that tightrope and between the lines, so to speak. And I believe they're going to continue to do that. Okay, that gives me, I think, a really good sense of what's going on there. And as we talk about what's going on in the West, in the U.S., I want to go back to the comment you made about interest in gold in the East. So we know that there is this divide between the East and the West in terms of attitudes toward gold. And it's been really interesting for me. It seems over here, I see this among our audience and, and elsewhere, of course, it seems like there's this sense of disbelief that this this is actually happening for gold, whereas over in the East, it seems like people are people are buying, they're interested. What is your sense of general sentiment in the gold market and what you see going on there? Does this feel normal to you for a bull market? Actually, a little bit. If we're talking about uh, attitude in the West, when Costco begins to sell gold and silver in their stores, that tells me that the demand is coming from a much wider socioeconomic um, class of individuals than it has in the past. Whereas maybe 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, it was something that only a certain level um, of individuals that were very well in place in terms of their, their money and their status within society and their ability to have a strong, diversified portfolio. And the fact that you've got gold and silver being sold at Costco says that there's a whole new marketplace that's opening up, which is the everyman, all individuals are able to begin to accumulate at whatever level they're able to some of their savings into gold or into silver. And so, I mean, to me, the fact that Costco would be selling gold is a huge statement because that really puts it on the retail level. And I've never seen that before. So that's something that is different from what we've seen a couple of years back. That is a, a, a tremendous statement when you think about the implications because a, a company like that doesn't market something like that to its consumer base unless they've got some data saying there's real demand for it. They don't just put it in a speculation. Maybe people will want to buy it. And so the fact that they've been offering that, I believe for about a year, year and a half, tells me that their data supports the fact that there's a more broad-based interest throughout the uh, economic classes within the U.S. as well as Canada, let's call it North America, for the precious yellow metal than historically we have ever seen. Whereas, as you also correctly pointed out, in places like India and China, uh, having part of a portfolio has always been revered as something that you do in the East, in India, and it's only recent that we're seeing that kind of spill over into the West. Really good point about Costco. I, I know it has been really popular there. I heard so much about it when those sales first started, but it kind of started to to slip my mind. So I think that's a good reminder that that is still going on and happening over here. So I know when it comes to gold and silver and other things, you're keeping a close eye on charts and what's going on from a technical perspective. So mm -hmm. 
As we look forward into 2024, what are you seeing for gold from a technical perspective? Do you have a target in mind that we're heading toward? I do. Whether we'll achieve it is another thing, but I, I absolutely do have a uh, target in mind. And let me go ahead and pull up a chart. I'm going to look at two different charts today, if you don't mind. This first chart, which should be up on the screen, is in what's called candlestick format. Each of these candles represents a day in trading. And this one is really starting from April of this year when we had gold down at around $2,300 per ounce. And it shows the different moves up. I've, I've noted this quintuple top, the fact that up until the breakout that occurred a week ago or last Friday, we've seen market forces move gold on an intraday basis. This wick, this little line that comes in in a candlestick, for those unfamiliar with it, is the relationship to, from the real body to the high of the day. In other words, for a candlestick, the way you create it is you put a rectangle around the open and closing price. On a green candle, it means that it opened and closed higher. On a red candle, it means it opens and closes lower. And so while this uses the exact same four data points, open, close, high, and low, that you use in a bar chart, it's just a lot more visual. So these little wicks that you see, these little lines, are a move in the case of this candle here from the opening price to this high that came in just around 25.20. You got it again uh, May 20th. You had this area that came in on the 17th of July. Here, the 2nd of August. And then here, the 14th of August. On each of these occasions, gold moved to that level, but was unable to sustain that price point, meaning it sold off by the close of the market. That seemed to change on Friday when we had a $51 gain taking it above this area with a fever, so to speak. There was a lot of momentum moving it higher, and then it seemed as though it was forming a base. And, of course, this is Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, and Monday as a small red candle. This represents last Friday. Today, we had the market sell off. You see how you've got that wick that goes below it. But if you look at the real body on a red candle, the top represents the open and the bottom represents the close, and it's sitting right now at 2520. So we have identified $2,520 as a key level of technical support. Um, in terms of what I'm looking at, in terms of potential, I basically have a much longer term view. This goes back to cover the entire year. This, of course, is 2023. The beginning of this year was defined as a corrective period called a corrective phase. I'm using uh, two basic technical studies, Elliott Wave Theory, Fibonacci Extensions, and Retracements. And so in Elliott Wave Theory, basically, he believes that a market that moves will move in a defined pattern, which will repeat over time if the fundamentals, the underlying fundamentals are causing the market to move to higher pricing. Uh, that's called a bull count. And so the first part is called the motor phase and is composed of five waves. Waves one, two, three, four, and five, where waves five, three, and one are simply called impulse waves, meaning it's moving in the primary trend direction. And waves two and four are the corrective waves in between it. After you complete the fifth wave here, you go into a correction. The correction can unfold in a number of ways. In both cases, we've had a correction that was a asymmetrical triangle, meaning it had a flat bottom and a, a descending top, a series of lower highs here as well as here. And so according to the model that, that I've created here, using Elliott Wave, at the end of June, the clock restarted, so we got our wave one again. And just as we went one through five earlier in the year, I believe that we've completed wave one, wave two, and I believe that we are currently in our third wave, which means 
that if this model holds weight and if the market unfolds in any way with a high correlation to this model, we will see gold continue to move a higher. We will have a, a strong corrective fourth wave and then a final fifth wave. Following that, you will go back into a corrective phase. And I think that the moves that have no data because if they haven't occurred yet, I believe will occur anywhere between uh, the end of this year, first quarter of next year. My target right now for the conclusion, meaning when this mode of phase completes is going to be just shy of 2,700. That's been my target for a while. I did revise it uh, once mid-year because initially I was looking for 2,500. And once we got close to that, I realized that that was a little bit uh, too modest of a upside target. And right now my target is and has been $2,700. Not tomorrow, not next month, but by the first quarter of 2025. And that's really what I am looking at. Okay. Thank you very much for, for going through that. I think it's very clear and it really helps me at least to see the chart. And I think you answered another question that I had on the gold price. And that is, I think a lot of people are looking at what's going on. They are aware that gold is going to go higher, but they're not sure when they might be able to add to their holdings at a good price. So any, any further thoughts on that? <clears throat> well, it becomes very, uh, very much an individual thing. If, if you are, have been an investor in gold, you've already accumulated. If you're a physical investor, I should say, and you've accumulated, you obviously, if you're going to add, want to add on what we call the dips. So as the market's moving up and it has this breakout, and especially when the breakout looks like it's never going to stop going up, that's when you've got to kind of want pour cold water on your face and go, well, wait a minute. Trees don't grow to the sky. They never have. They never will. That's a statement from uh, Ben Bernanke um, talking about interest rates, but it, apl it applies to any price point in a commodity, in a stock. There is absolute tops and bottoms. And so you want to wait for a dip in the market. And when the market's moving down, and you see that overall, the overall consensus has become bearish, that's typically a time to accumulate, although it takes some strength to do that because it's hard not to fight that inner feeling that, okay, it's, you know, it's done doing its, its rise and now it's going to just start going down. The key is this, the fundamentals that have moved uh, gold prices to these historical levels are still very much in play and are still exerting the force that has been moving gold higher. As long as those forces are there, we can expect that gold will either form a base at these new levels for a while and then move up or form a base and move up slightly, but that you won't see a major top and then a multi-year correction like we did in the middle of 2011 when we first hit 1900 and then many analysts including myself back then thought it was going to 2000 it hit 1900 it was like to the moon and of course that was fear of missing out that was the whole strategy in which you saw something that had never occurred this is different and the reason i believe this is different is if we think about the chart that I just pulled up where I show the multiple times that gold challenged 2,500 and went back down, the fact that it has now exceeded that and today moved below that means that this might be the point to add um, rather than having added at $2,560, the recent highs that we got earlier this week. And so for that reason, you, you want to buy on a downstroke, so to speak. If, in fact, gold over time is going to continue to rise, it almost doesn't matter, or it doesn't matter as much, I should say, buying effectively on a dip, because if, the, if gold prices are going to continue to advance to higher levels, no matter where you buy it long term, six months, a year from now, 
those prices will be in the wind and you won't be able to buy at that level. So that's why it becomes less important in terms of market timing. What becomes important is that if it continues to hold these values and rise over time, you want to have some strategy to accumulate and add to that position periodically. That would be the one thing I would uh, tell investors to focus on. Okay, that makes definitely a lot of sense to me. And I want to throw in a question about silver as well. So, of course, this year we have silver on the move. We did see it get past $30 per ounce. But unlike gold, silver is is well off its all-time highs. So I'm curious what you see from a technical perspective coming for silver. Because I know, I know a lot of people are wondering, is there a breakout coming there? <clears throat> the high correlation that used to exist between gold and silver has absolutely dissipated. It's not there any longer. <clears throat> On the first occasion when gold traded to 1900 in the middle of 2011, silver moved in tandem with it. It moved to $50. We had a protracted multi-year correction till the end of 2015, 2016. Gold went down to, I believe, a low of 1,020. In other words, it pretty much halved in price. Silver also went down, but then... As gold moved up, silver was unable to follow suit. And so with the exception of 2021, a brief period in 2020, when silver challenged 30 to $33 per ounce, it has not performed in any way close to the performance of gold. On a technical basis, we, are, we were looking before prices declined today with silver breaking back above $29. My sense is a breakout would have to occur after we had a solid base in silver above 30. And if that's the case, we would have to see if it continues to climb, how it reacts at 33 and 32, because that is the recent record level of silver. It's perplexing in that the performance of silver compared to gold has been so muted. I'm not going to attempt to explain it because personally, uh, I can't explain it to myself. The facts are the facts and silver's underperformed gold in terms of percentage gains overall in the big picture. On a day-to-day -day instance, uh, and that, that's still where there's noise in the market, and I mean by noise is it's not sustainable. Silver still tends to outperform gold on many occasions in terms of percentage gain. And percentage declines are much deeper in terms of the percentage decline. I think that the first area of resistance comes in at around 30 and then 33. I would need to see silver break above $33 on a closing basis for a period of time, a week, 10 days, before I would be feel bullish enough about silver to say the next price level is now going to be where silver moves to, and that would be $40. The fact is we haven't seen, since silver went to $50 a decade plus ago, we haven't seen it even attempt to get close to it or take it out. 33 is the new 50, let's say, in silver. And before I felt comfortable thinking that it would go back to those levels, it needs to break above $33 because that's been the recent ceiling. That's very interesting. And it's it's almost refreshing, I think, to hear you say this broker relationship. You're not really sure what's going on there because I think a lot of people are also wondering what is happening. But thank you for going into that. And I think this is a nice place to wrap up. But before I let you go, I'll put it back to you in case you had any final thoughts that you would share in, with investors. Maybe let everybody know where they could find you if they want to follow you and learn more. Certainly, and, and thank you for asking. First of all, my, my final thoughts is we are living through a historical time. I have been highly focused on gold for, for a lesser part silver since 2009 when I started the gold forecast, which was exclusively geared to 
following gold and silver moves. I became involved in the commodity industry in 1983. I was an introducing broker. I then became an analyst. And these times, 2010 to current, has really been a historical time with the last couple of years being exceptionally interesting because we've seen prices double in gold in an unprecedented way. And now we can say, well, this is normal, but it wasn't two years ago. I believe that gold almost has only one way it can go long-term over time, and that's moving higher. And the reason I believe that is not many countries, if any country, is having a uh, budgetary restraint based upon what they have in the coffers. In other words, Keynesian economics means that when uh, when an economy is is kind of under, is not moving as quickly as they want it to, when we could face a recession, we print more money, we, in, we really devalue whether it's the dollar, the yen, the Swiss franc, the British pound, the euro, we depreciate the buying power of that currency as well as the value of that currency by virtue that that country is spending more money than it has and their national debt is growing. As long as countries operate with those constraints, gold has to become more valuable because A, there is an intrinsic value and B, it is tied to underlying currencies. And so as long as and we'll say the example of the United States, as long as they're spending more money than their GDP, than they're taking in, the buying power and value of that dollar has to continue to diminish, which means that gold will at least have to be steady to higher. And so I think that's going to continue for decades. I don't see that changing, <clears throat> which means that all investors should at least be aware of how they can participate in accumulating gold and silver on a physical basis, on trading it, whether it's electronically traded funds like GLD or SLB, and in to find out more information about what I do specifically. As you mentioned, I have a daily article in Kitco, but thegoldforecast.com is our primary website where we list everything. We have all of our videos and those that are interested and think that they could gain value from the information I presented today and present every day, I would recommend that you take us up on our offer for a free trial. It's 14 days. It costs nothing. And if at the end of the two weeks you see that it has, it has intrinsic value and that you find the information actionable and you can be a better trader or investor because of it, move forward and, and take us on as a premium subscriber. If you don't see the value, all you do is send us an email and you'll never be charged anything. And that's the best way to find out more about us. On YouTube, we have about 2,000 videos you can do your research on as to what I've said in the past. But really, to, to look at us in real time, go to thegoldforecast.com, sign up for the free trial. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll leave the links in the video description in case people want to check it out. And thank you very much for coming on to go over gold and silver and the markets right now. This is really valuable for me. Thanks so much for having me. It was very enjoyable. Of course. And once again, I am Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com and this is Gary Wagner. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below.